A few years back in our Board of Christian Ed meeting, we began talking about our Sunday school program for children, and we had made some changes, we made some shifts, and one of the things that came out of that meeting was this idea that we want our children to be learning and hearing stories that we hear in worship. So that at the end of the day, when the children and the parents go home, they would have something to talk about. They'd all be talking about the scriptures. And and so what what happened over the last couple of years is is COVID and really Sunday school never really got off the ground. And and so we tried to do that and and, uh, it really didn't work the way we had planned. But we're going to try it again. And so what you will find over the course of the next year is that the same stories that our children are hearing and learning about in children's church are going to be the same things that we're going to be talking about in the sermon. And so today, as you heard from my friend Fireman Pete, we're going to be talking about Moses. You heard the scripture that Anita read. And you know what's amazing about that scripture is that it's a story that almost everybody knows. Whether you've gone to church your whole life or maybe you've just been an occasional observer outside of church, everybody knows about Moses and the burning bush. But what they don't think about is that that moment could very well have never happened. God could have been speaking in that bush and Moses could have been thinking something else, daydreaming, off, ignoring it. You know, our dog, our puppy, Baxter, is eight months old now. And, uh, and uh, we got him as just a puppy almost four months ago, and he had no training. And he was wild. And, uh, and so what we, <laughs> what we thought was, if I took him to six weeks of training, it would make all the difference in the world. And, and all I can say is this, that he, he got a C- minus because he was talking in class all the time. And this talking has not stopped, and he will bark at us and yip at us and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I thought that he would be a new dog after that class, but no, he has a mind of his own. And sometimes I think he just isn't able to pay attention because I'll give him a command, and he just ignores me. I call his name, he continues to do whatever he's doing, whether it's chewing on a shoe or barking at a squirrel. Now, you dog owners know what I'm talking about because you've been there. And and for you cat owners, (laughs) I hate to tell you this, I have hope for Baxter, but cat owners, they always just do what they want. They don't pay attention to anything. Well, it's frustrating. But I have to tell you that as I'm working and dealing with Baxter, there are moments when I can identify with God and his desire to call you and me. We get so caught up sometimes in what we're doing that we can be as bad as Baxter and miss out on what God is calling us to do. And that's simply because we aren't paying attention. You know, Baxter loves treats. He loves to eat. But sometimes he's so busy chewing someone's pants or coat or ripping up the woodwork that he doesn't see I have a treat in my hand. And then when he notices, he says, oh, good, and he comes back. And sometimes I think that's how we are with God. We just don't notice what he's doing and what he's saying to us. Now Moses was in a low place at the point of this encounter. He had fled Egypt and the good life, and he was living in the wilderness. He started over. God and the plight of his family and friends were a thing of the past. He had a new family and a new life. And I'm sure there were moments where he just didn't want to think about the past. He did what so many of us have done when we get beat up and thrown around. We just move on. We leave the past in the past. But you know what? Even when we run from God, God doesn't give up on us. And this is another one of those biblical stories where where it seems like Moses leaves God behind, he leaves everything he knows behind, and yet God follows him into the wilderness. There wasn't a moment when God wasn't aware of what was happening in Moses' life. He knew the hurt, he knew the fear, he knew the guilt, the disappointment, the sense of helplessness that Moses felt. And God gave him some space. And sometimes I think God gives us some space too when we're going through a hard time. He doesn't try to come in and and, and tell us it's going to be all right. He knows that we have to work things out. But he promised to be there. 
You know, I, I've shared this story a few times. When I first went to Norwich a number of years ago, back in the, the mid-80s, I went to visit one of our elderly women. Her name was Bertha, Bertha Wilcox. And, and uh, she was sitting outside her apartment one day when I stopped in and, and we started to chat for a while. And, and then she said, you know, I don't go to church. And of course I knew because I had the roles and I kind of, it was a small congregation. I knew where everybody sat and there was no seat with her name on it. And uh, she said, you know, I stopped going to church a long time ago because uh, of a tragedy in my life. My five-year-old little boy had gone down to the bus stop and he was run over by a car. And she said, I've never been able to forgive God for allowing that to happen. I stopped going to church and I keep arguing with God and saying, God, you're so good, why would you let this happen? And I keep talking to God and I keep telling God how, how hurt I am and how my life will never be the same. Now, she was in her 80s at the time, and I was in my 20s. I thought 80 was old. 80s looking awful young these days. <laughs> but I said to her, I said, you know what? I said, Bertha, the fact that you're still talking to God after all these years is a good thing. And God is hearing every teardrop fall. And God still cares about you and loves you. And he doesn't hold this against you. It's a tragedy in this world we live in this fallen world where these bad things happen. You know, life is hard with trials and challenges. Sometimes we, we, we buy into this idea that if we give our life to Christ, everything is going to be great and we're going to have oodles of money and all our relationships are going to be perfect. We're going to have the perfect world we live in, the job around us, and yet we know, we know that it doesn't always happen that way, that sometimes the most faithful people still are faced with great challenges. The scripture tells us that the devil has his way in this world. He, he is still wreaking havoc. And God has said you can do that for a time. But there will become a time when you'll be cast out and I will take control again. You know, just like he did in the life of Job, the devil sometimes gets at us. But that doesn't mean that God walks away. God is always with us. He walks with us through those dark valleys. That's why David could say, with all the ups and downs in his life, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you'll be with me. David was trying to remind us that in those dark and difficult moments, God does not leave us. God is there in the midst of it. He visits us and takes care of us while we're in the wilderness and doing the wandering. He stayed in the background, but he was with Moses and he gave Moses a new family. He gave Elijah food and water when he was running and tired and worn out. He gave Peter a chance to redeem himself at the right time. You know, One of the speakers at the Sing conference we went to last week noted that some people believe that God created the world, but then just wandered off and left us on our own. That's kind of a deist position, that God was the creator, but he doesn't really get involved after that. Yet the Bible tells us a different story. Our God is a God who wants to rescue and redeem his people from their plight. One of the greatest stories in the Bible that speaks of both personal and communal redemption is this story of Moses. If, if you were paying attention to the scripture reading, here's Moses long years out of Egypt and God says to him, I've seen you and I've heard the cries of my children, my Israel children in Egypt and now has come the time for me to redeem them, to save them, to lead them out of bondage. And Moses, you're the one who I'm sending to do it. You know, Moses made all kinds of excuses, but, but I love the story because what it says is that what's important to us is often important to God. The reason Moses was in this predicament is because he watched the brutality of the Egyptian guards on the Hebrew slaves. And it was one day when he walked out there and he saw the guard beating the man that he couldn't take it anymore. And he said, when will this end? God, where are you? Why are you allowing this to happen? And he struck the man and killed him. And then he had to run for his life. And on that day, in that bush, with that voice, God was telling Moses, I heard your prayers. 
and I never forgot you, and now is the time, and you're going to help me. You know, Moses' life is a great story about the way that God works in people's lives. You remember the, the early stories. Moses was born in a time of terror where Pharaoh had made a decision that he was going to kill all the newborns. And so there was a wailing in the land as all the Hebrew children, because the Hebrews were growing even greater in number than the Egyptians, they were going to kill the babies. By the grace of God, Moses, his mother and sister, put him in a basket, put him in among the reeds, and, and wouldn't you know it? It just so happened. I love, and the Bible doesn't say in this case, it just so happened, but it's one of those, it just so happened that there was Moses in the bulrushes and And Pharaoh's daughter found him and took him in. And Pharaoh's daughter made him her own. So here was this child who was spared from death, raised in the house of Pharaoh, knowing all the luxuries, knowing all the ways of the king and his people. And yet at heart, he was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew And God had spared him and set him apart for this role later in his life. You know, when Moses left Egypt, you might think that that was the end of the story. But in Exodus 3 here, God reveals himself to Moses in the wilderness. I like how the text puts it. He came to Oreb, the mountain of God. Now, Moses wasn't looking for that place. When he took his sheep out, his flock out there, he was just looking for a good place where they could find grass and eat. And there at the base of the mountain was a good spot for them. And so he set up camp. The sheep were out there. The flock was eating. And all of a sudden there, on this place that would be known as the mountain of God, God shows up. And later he says to Moses, once you free my people, You'll come back here and worship me because this is holy ground. So much of life seems to be happenstance and circumstance and coincidence. We just end up at the right place at the right time. Things seem to come out of nowhere. Well, I don't think so. These are little God winks. I was talking with someone last night and they said, I love God winks. I love when all of a sudden you're doing something or you're somewhere and you realize in that moment that it is a, 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 a special time where, where you can almost sense that God is down there winking at you and say, hey, I got you here. <laughs> something special is going to happen. You know, when we go on mission trips, I often say to the folks on the trip, I said, when you go out in the morning, look for God. Because God will reveal himself if you're looking for him. And it may be in the face and the smile of a child. Or it may be in a homeowner who brings you a a pasta dinner for lunch. But God is there and God is always around. Psalm 139 reminds us that no matter where we go, no matter how far we run, God is always there before us. We may not see him, but he's there for us. It, it sounds like something out of one of these science fiction movies where, where all of a sudden you go here and, and you see God and you go over here and you see God and God is always before us. I love that prayer where it says, God be before me, God be beside me, and God be behind me. Because God is always nearby. The text tells us that this is how God revealed himself to Moses. He revealed himself in a burning bush. Now Moses, probably like most of us, if we saw something like that, we would want to investigate say, what's going on here? And so he did what was natural. He looked at the bush and then God spoke to him out of that bush. Moses had no clue it was God at first just happened to see this strange thing. Can you imagine if he was so caught up in his own pity that he missed this? We said, no way. You you would have noticed that in a minute, but yet you and I can probably, if we're honest with one another, we can say that there are moments in our life when we look back, we say, that was God. Or there was something amazing that happened and, and I didn't even realize it. Hindsight is twenty twenty, they say, and there's a reason for that, because often it's only when we look back we can begin to see the amazing things that God has done and the appearances that He's made. But we were so busy, we were looking down, we were looking away, we were looking over that we didn't see it. When Keith Getty at the conference asked Gloria Gaither how she came up with the lyrics of her songs, 
It was a humorous interlude as they were asking questions of, of Bill and Gloria. And, uh, and they said, so how is it? You, you have such amazing lyrics and you tell a story in those songs. How is it? And this is what she said. She said, we witness miracles every day. We just fail to see them because we're looking elsewhere. And she says, so I make it a point to, as I go through the day to look for God because I know that if I'm looking, if I'm paying attention, I will see Him. And when I do, I write it down and it becomes a song. Take the birth of a baby. I'll never forget seeing my first live birth. You know, again, as you're a teenager and young adult, you see lots of pregnant women. You know, and again, you don't think much about it. But as part of my chaplaincy training, they said there were two things that we had to do and we had to reflect and write upon because they were both speaking to miracles of God. And, and the one of them was a, a live birth. Now, you know, I, I, I get sick to my stomach at the sight of blood and I was not looking forward to it. And we were in our little group and all of a sudden the call came, got to get down to labor and delivery quick. And so we're all hustling down the hall and we're in this room. And of course, the woman had agreed to this because it was a teaching hospital. <clears throat> and I'll never forget, we're standing there and all of a sudden you see the head of the baby and then this baby comes out. And I thought to myself, this is a miracle. How can that be? This beautiful new life was, was right there, born right before us. And every time a baby is born, it is a miracle to behold. The only other times I've experienced such a joy and such a miracle is when my three girls were born. And I was able to be there. <clears throat> and yet, sometimes we take that for granted. <clears throat> we think that burning bush was amazing. But you see, God sets off flares and reveals himself in our lives every day. The problem is that whether we either explain them away or we ignore them. But thank God that Moses didn't do that. He stopped and took notice. And guess what happened? He had that divine encounter with God. I said earlier that God is in the business of redemption. Moses may have thought that God had forgotten him when he was fleeing Egypt, because that's what we often think when trouble comes. Where is God? Why didn't He do something? Why is this happening to me? But God doesn't abandon us. He goes with us. You know, my oldest daughter, Rebecca, I'll never forget the first day of school, <clears throat> going to kindergarten, and uh, we were standing there on the street corner as the bus came up. And as she got up on the bus, she got up there with fear and trepidation, climbed up and took my pictures and got on there. And then got in the car and we raced to the school. And so parked the car, got out there, ran down because we knew where the buses were going to let off. And as she got off the bus, there we were, ready to meet her on her first day of school, taking a picture. You know, that's what God does with us. He meets us as we go, and He meets us as we come. What God does is in that moment, in that burning bush, is He redefines Moses' life and He gives him a new purpose. He says, now you, you go and tell Pharaoh. And when Moses objects and comes up with all kinds of excuses, God says, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You were born for this and you are not going alone. I will go with you just as I've been with you in the wilderness, just as I've been with you in your, in your fear and your worry and your trepidation. I will stand with you when you go before Pharaoh. I will give you the words today to say. You know, God was making a commitment right there and then to stick with Moses like glue. He was telling him that he was not only forgiven for what happened in Egypt when he struck down that guard, but that he was going to be a friend of God to the ends. Not only that, but he was going to use Moses to redeem his people and deliver them. You see, that's how God works. He not only reaches out to us, but he then calls us to be a partner in his plan to redeem the world. We see it in Elijah. We see it in the prophets. We see it in Peter, John, and the disciples. We see it in Paul. I love Paul's story. Here was Paul, so zealous for the Lord, but going down the wrong way street. God takes him off his high horse, turns him around, and he became the great evangelist and began to share Christ everywhere. Christ crucified. Christ born again. Christ Savior. The one common denominator in all these people 
whom God used was the fact that when a miracle happened, when God called, they were aware enough to listen and respond. And when God called, they stopped to pay attention. Are you paying attention today? I believe God wants to use each and every one of you to make a difference in someone's life. You may say, well, I'm too old. I've I've done that before. I told you the story about one of the pastors that I met. He had been the pastor of our church in Cross Mills years before and all crippled up with arthritis. And I said to him, I said, boy, it must be hard for you. You can't do what you used to do. You don't have any ministry. I was basically saying to him, you're all used up. You're all worn out. And you're just kind of living out your days. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, every day, three times a day, I have my list here and I just pray. That's what God has given me to do today. 89 years old, crippled up with arthritis. He still had more to do. Josh McClure went up to visit Josh McClure. I think I've said this before. And Josh was saying, he's saying at 90, almost 91, he's saying, you know, I felt like just wasn't doing enough. (laughs) Wasn't doing enough. So now he's doing this online Bible study on the fourth Saturday of every month. And he invites each and every one of us to go online and, and to go back and study the basics of our faith with him. 91 years old. Some of you are saying, I'm 42 and I'm having a hard time doing things. I'm 62 or 82. I believe God wants to use each and one of us to make a difference in someone's life. And maybe he's been calling you, but maybe your phone was busy. I'll never forget, years ago I used to get up early in the morning and there was a show put on by the Paulist Fathers. And it was called Insight. And each week they had a little dramatic episode and there was a little message behind it. And I'll never forget this one episode where this man, a businessman, was in his office and he was just going through a difficult time and he's, he's railing and ranting, ranting at God saying, God, God, you know, I've trusted you. I put in, and, and now I, I just don't hear your voice. Why can't you speak to me? And, and as he's ranting and raving, the phone starts to ring. And he just keeps on going, going and saying, God, do something, God. Let me know that you're, you're aware of my situation. You know, call me. Let me know. And the phone's ringing. And the phone's ringing. And the phone's ringing as he goes on and on and on. And the message of that episode was this, is that sometimes God is calling, but we're not hearing the phone. I thank, so, I thank God so much that on that day, outside that mountain, that Moses put aside whatever was on his mind that day to notice the burning bush, because it changed history for the Israelites and it changed history for him. And the truth is that when we hear God call, when God comes to us in our burning bush moment, whatever that may be, and we hear that, we pay attention to that, and we answer that call, God will change our life and the lives of the people around us. But you have to be paying attention. So as we leave here today, I want to encourage you to do this is to open your eyes. And if you need help opening your eyes, then say, God, help me. Open my eyes. Open my ears so that I can hear you, so that I can see you, so that you, when you wink at me, I can know that it's you and that I can go forward and serve you and change the little world, the little bit of world that I live in and change people's lives. Let me just suggest three quick ways to maintain your focus and be prepared to hear God's voice. Number one, read the Bible. Open up the scriptures every day. Make it a point. Start with the Gospels. Read about Jesus. Don't have to read a lot. Just read a little bit every day. Open the Bible. God will speak to you through the Word. Second, come to worship. I know some of you are watching from home and and for whatever reason, life is busy. Maybe you're still nervous about coming back, but, but you've got out of the practice of worship. Come back to worship. Those of you who are here, you're saying, well, I go every six weeks. Well, that's okay. I'm glad you're here. But come to worship because sometimes in the midst of worship, through the singing or through the praying or through the message, God has a word for you to hear. And the third thing is join a small group. We got some of these small group Bible studies. I said in my Bible study this morning on the facts about Baptists that that we grow and learn when we are with one another talking about the gospel. And so as you gather with others, God speaks And maybe he speaks through you, and maybe he speaks through someone else in the group. But if you do these simple things, you will hear God's voice, and your life will be changed. Amen. We're going to close our service by singing our last hymn. It is... um,
I lost my